Over 38 years have passed since the Chernobyl disaster, the biggest catastrophe in the history of nuclear energy. You know what happened. Reactor explosion, fire, a huge amount of radioactive substances released into the environment. After the accident, everyone was evacuated from the exclusion zone, over 350,000 people. Up to 50 people died from causes directly tied to the disaster, and up to 4,000 people died from the long-term effects of radiation, and people are still dying. The area around the station will never be the same again. The accident changed the wild nature affecting all living things, except the wild boars. Today, the wild boars live comfortably with the same level of radiation as on the day of the disaster, as if they aren't affected by the radiation at all. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's a bit dry. Just need a little coffee and we'll continue. Here's an unobtrusive reminder to hit the like button if you do that kind of thing at the end of the video or while watching. Let's keep going. Let's start with the facts. The Chernobyl disaster of 1986 released a significant amount of Celsium-137, a radioactive isotope with a half-life of just over 30 years, into the environment. But since the incident, more than three decades have passed. So all scientists assumed that the level of the isotope in the contaminated area had dropped by at least 50%. It seemed logical and somehow right. The expectations came true with all the animals. The level of contamination in deer, for example, dropped every year. There's a simple explanation for this. Cesium gradually dispersed after the disaster, was washed away by rainwater, bound with minerals or perhaps migrated deep into the soil, so deep that it stopped being absorbed by plants and then by animals too at least not in the same amounts as before. According to the tests, it's clear that most food samples in the exclusion zone have not just half the original cesium concentration, but a lot less. But everything went well until it came to checking the boars. Suddenly, it turned out that their radiation contamination level was still as if the disaster had happened just yesterday. 30-some years? What? 30-some years? The level of radiation in wild boar meat is so high that this meat is unfit for consumption. It's just dangerous. Imagine how surprised scientists were when they discovered this anomaly. The wild boars of Chernobyl have become a scientific mystery. Some scientists even suggested that cesium dissolves better in the fat tissue of wild boars and stays there longer. But the research didn't confirm this. Instead, it became clear that wild boars just broke the laws of physics. This phenomenon even got the name wild boar paradox. The mystery was solved only in 2023. A team of scientists finally managed to trace the source of the radioactivity using the latest measurements. It was very difficult, but the result was worth it because it stunned everyone. It turned out that wild boars had been carrying a different cesium isotope all along, which was not connected to the Chernobyl disaster. Cesium-135 This isotope has a much longer half-life than cesium-137, and it's much harder to detect even with equipment. Naturally, the question immediately came up about where cesium-135 actually came from in the wild boars and why their radioactivity wasn't going down. Researchers figured out that it's likely connected to the diet of wild boars. They looked into Bavarian wild boars but believed the same findings could apply to Chernobyl boars. So the diet. It mainly consists of deer truffles. These are fungi located at a depth of 8 to 16 inches underground. Cesium seeps into the soil very slowly, so the underground fungi are only now starting to absorb the isotope released from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. At the same time, the fungi are still contaminated with other cesium isotopes. Cesium-135 got into the soil much earlier in the 1960s when nuclear bomb tests were going on. Scientists have confirmed a larger share of cesium in wild boar meat is linked to nuclear weapons testing. In some samples, it reaches up to 68%. The pathways for cesium to enter boar bodies are the same, a very slow descent into the soil, sometimes just 0.04 inches a year, and then absorption by fungi. But cesium-135 had 25 more years to do that. So deer truffles are just now beginning to feel the effects of the Chernobyl accident. If fungi could be surprised, it would probably be surprised. And yes, a similar situation is seen in Germany. According to some studies, a large portion of the German wild boar population is radioactive. So much so that German hunters who have killed a wild boar must hand it over to the authorities for inspection. Not because the authorities want to control everything too much, just because the meat often turns out to be so radioactive that it's simply dangerous. In that case, it must be destroyed. Because of this, many hunters have completely stopped hunting wild boars, which has created a new problem their spread. 
Yep, in this world, not everything is that simple. But if you think about it, it's a really unexpected problem. You kind of expect radioactive boars to live in the exclusion zone. But in Germany? At first, scientists couldn't understand how this was even possible. And the reason turned out to be the same old story. Nuclear tests from the 60s and the pig's diet, which includes truffles. Because of the truffle, the level of radiation contamination in wild boar meat isn't dropping. And it won't drop for a long time because cesium has to completely disappear from the soil. Only then will the contamination cycle break. A similar story happened with reindeer, and not just anywhere, but in Norway. It might seem like it's been almost 40 years since the Chernobyl accident, but it still affects the reindeer. And yes, they are radioactive. Back in 1986, the wind carried pollutants from the accident site for many miles. And in Norway, due to the continuous downpour, 1.5 pounds of radioactive cesium-137 settled on the ground. And when it comes to cesium-137, 1 1.5 pounds is a lot. Through rain, radioactive materials ended up in the lakes and forests, contaminating wildlife, berries, and plants. They also reached the lichen, a type of fungus algae growing on trees, and by the way, a favorite treat for reindeer. Since lichen naturally lacks a root system, it absorbs nutrients from the air, making it perfect for soaking up all that cesium-137. As a result, the reindeer unknowingly ate the poisoned lichen and became radioactive. Time for jokes about why Santa's reindeer really has a glowing nose. Naturally, the meat of these deer became dangerous to eat. Scientists determined this in 1986, and in 2014, when a check was done again, the deer were still damn radioactive. All right, we figured out what's the deal with the contaminated meat, but what about the more interesting things? If we believe pop culture, radiation should create terrifying mutants, real monsters, bloodthirsty and deadly. Naturally, all these monsters are supposed to inhabit the exclusion zone because their ancestors got too high a dose of radiation after the nuclear plant disaster. Some myths are partly true. The radioactive shock from the reactor explosion plus chronic exposure to small doses of radiation led to morphological, physiological, and genetic abnormalities in all studied animal species. Populations in the exclusion zone are deformed in a completely different way than any others, but not enough to turn into real monsters. It's known that animals died much more often after the disaster, and the reasons were very similar to the changes in human health. Increased number of tumors and immune deficiencies, sharp reduction in lifespan, premature aging, changes in blood and the circulatory system, developmental defects, and much more. Again, this didn't make the monsters dead, yes, but not monsters. Today, there are reports of healthy animals in the exclusion zone, but it's believed that they came there after the catastrophe rather than being descendants of those who survived it. However, some animals were indeed caught up in the explosion at the nuclear power plant, faced its aftermath, but survived. These were dogs. When researchers collected DNA samples from the Chernobyl dogs, they all turned out to be descendants of the dogs that lived there during the disaster. Overall, there are no mutants in the exclusion zone, although the animals are different from others. Not too much. They're just quite large and not afraid of people. At all. Chernobyl animals simply aren't used to encountering humans and don't know that in the rest of the world, people are supposed to be avoided. This includes wild boars, foxes, wolves, roe deer, hares, many different birds, and even bears. And you might even say that the Chernobyl disaster ended up helping the animals. Of course, I'm not talking about those who died from radiation effects, but the animal population in the exclusion zone grew pretty quickly after the accident. For instance, the number of roe deer increased tenfold over 10 years without humans, and the wolf density in the exclusion zone is over seven times higher than in other similar areas. Scientists attribute this to the lack of people. But why haven't scary mutants been born? Oddly enough, it all comes down to the time needed for an animal to reproduce. Radiation, being a mutagen, works well on microorganisms and organisms with very short intervals from birth to offspring, but for a slightly larger organism, even the size of a vole, radiation is more likely to kill rather than cause mutations. This is because it will mostly be absorbed by tissues. For something capable of greatly increasing mutation rates to affect reproductive cells, a dose is needed where the organism won't survive. So no saber-toothed rats or deer with tentacles, everything's very mundane. However, even knowing all this, wild boars proved to be damn resilient. I mean, of course there wasn't some mass death of animals all at once. The number of all animals decreased with the rise in background radiation. Everyone had a certain amount of time before the early death came. But the question is how the animals used that time. 
After the Chernobyl disaster happened, all the animals had to survive, and hardly anyone is as good at surviving as wild boars. Literally everything that nature gave them works for survival in extreme conditions. Wild boars easily adapt and survive almost anywhere thanks to their high fertility, early maturity, ability to eat almost anything, long lifespan, and adaptability to everything. Heat? Cold? No problem at all. This made wild boars one of the most successful and harmful species on the planet, and also helped them survive the disaster. To better understand how all this worked, let's take a wild boar and a roe deer. Suppose both of them lived in the forest near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. A boar can reproduce at any time of the year as long as a male is found. Every 12 to 15 months, females have two litters with up to seven piglets in each. Six months later, these piglets are ready to reproduce, and the cycle repeats. But then an accident happens and our wild boar is left. Let's say two years to live? It of course doesn't know about it and just gets pregnant the very next day. It happens to find a suitable male. After 18 weeks or about four and a half months, five piglets are born. We won't consider how radiation affected them. But after six months, they're all ready to breed. And their mom is keeping up as well. Although radiation gives very little time, wild boars still manage to reproduce. What about roe deer? These animals reproduce once a year. The breeding season lasts from July to August, so it's really short. Pregnancy, on the other hand, takes a full 10 months, and usually only two fawns are born. To be ready for reproduction, roe deer also need about six months. But remember, the breeding season lasts from July to August, so almost a year must pass after birth before a young female gets pregnant. The Chernobyl disaster happened in April, so right after that, a roe deer couldn't possibly get pregnant. It was the wrong time of year. But even if you disregard the month, the situation is still quite different. While wild boars managed to produce several generations of piglets, roe deer barely gave birth to two fawns each. And it's still not clear whether they can even live a year to produce offspring. After all, roe deer aren't as good at adapting. So it turns out wild boars had a real advantage compared to other species. They also suffered from the fallout, got sick, and died from radiation. But when you can reproduce quickly and in large numbers from an evolutionary perspective, you're the coolest of them all. And you know, not only the Chernobyl wild boars turned out to be so hard to kill. Remember the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster? It happened in 2011. But even now, 12 miles of land around the plant remain an exclusion zone. It's a dangerous place you should stay away from if you're not a boar. The boars are thriving there. Researchers have confirmed after the nuclear disaster, the local population of wild boars surged sharply. And by sharply, I mean that in four years, 3,000 animals turned into 13,000. Wild boars use abandoned houses and empty buildings in the exclusion zone as places for breeding and shelter, and they feel great, even though their meat samples showed 300 times more cesium-137 than what's considered safe. Yeah, all because of their diet. Although the animals don't show any immediate signs of radiation effect. But if you ask farmers, they'd say these guys are real pests. Local authorities even offered hunters a reward for shooting wild boars, but if you've watched our videos about wild boars in the US, you know these guys reproduce so fast that no hunter can keep up with them. Mutant Wolves vs. Cancer This sounds like the title of some second-rate movie, but it's actually true. The population of wolves living in the Chernobyl exclusion zone is genetically different from their relatives outside the area. This is pretty understandable, not thanks to radiation. But here's the interesting thing. Not long ago, scientists found out that the irradiated wolves seem to have developed protective mutations. And while excessive radiation exposure leads to radiation sickness, which then develops into cancer, the Chernobyl wolves are different. They mutated in a way that gave them some resistance to cancer. Naturally, scientists are already figuring out how to use this ability to treat human cancer. New Horses at Chernobyl a few years back, 36 Shawalski's horses were deliberately brought into the exclusion zone. These are the horses that many people today think are the only true wild ones, not just feral. They were once extinct in the wild, but then they reintroduced them into their natural habitat. And then, it seems they decided to send them to the exclusion zone. It turned out that it was a pretty good decision. On the land free from humans, the Shawalski's horses' population is thriving. They even use abandoned human buildings as shelters. And yes, they just decided to use the exclusion zone as a reserve to save horses from another extinction. Who would have thought that it would work? Radioactive Pets 
During the height of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in 1986, thousands of people panicked and fled the nearby area, leaving behind hundreds of pets. Their descendants are still living in the exclusion zone, but recently efforts have been made to rescue them, put them in quarantine, examine them, vaccinate them, sterilize them, and then send them to new homes in the U.S. Would you like a radioactive puppy? I myself would appreciate a like, and I'd like one from you. See you later.